thank you for having me here. It, I, I do always find it interesting when I'm in an environment that's not my own and I get to hear, you know, what other people are talking about and sort of different topics. I will say that I feel a little bit like a fish out of water here. And uh, so I hope you do find some relevance to some of what I have to say. Um, so, let's see. Nope, I'm not get. It's not. Uh, let me try uh, this. I think it's not selected right now. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so, I know from hearing people talk here before already that you are all aware of the huge success that uh, large language models have had. And in NLP, this has certainly caused a paradigm shift. So, I mean, we've seen tremendous advances from uh, things like just editing style transfer to question answering and summarization. Um, and as we've seen from the GPT-4 technical uh, uh, manual, lots of success on different tests. Tests. Okay, there we go. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we have a lot of failures, which I'm sure uh, people here are also aware of. Um, some that uh, many people are working on involving hallucination, bias, toxicity, and untruthful generation. And what I'm going to be talking about today um, is work that we have been doing in the areas of hallucination and bias. Um, so that is one dimension uh, along which the talk splits. Um, and I'm going to be talking about it with, in the context of um, two separate areas, both of which would improve sort of interactive systems. Um, <clears throat> so one area is summarization, which I've been working on uh, for years. Um, and with summarization, uh, we aim to generate short overviews of documents that we may find online. And of course, um, systems like Alexa, Siri, Google Home, use that to be able to do open-ended uh, generation. So it is, can be a component of dialogue. A second area that we're looking at is um, how well large language models understand African American language. And here, again, would be important to have uh, ones that do um, as large language models are deployed in socially impactful con contexts. And we think particularly of health, uh, which includes mental health and various crisis scenarios, um, where we want our models to be able to interact with uh, the full spectrum of, of people in the, in the population. Um, so I am going to talk about, sort of give an overview of work that we have done in summarization on the problems of hallucination. We have done a lot more work in this area, so I'll spend more time in the talk on this. Um, I'll talk a little bit of, about our work on characterization, what types of errors occur and why. Um, mitigation, uh, what kinds of methods can we use to correct those errors. And here I'm going to be talking about it um, within the context of language modeling. So what we thought of as large language modeling until about a year ago. Um, but language models over the past oh, three, four, maybe five years. So things like BART, um, Pegasus, and, and so forth. Uh, and so I'll end this part with shifting to the most recent large language models and then looking at uh, whether and how they hallucinate. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll talk about our work on understanding African American language where, uh, well, we have a paper appearing at EMNLP, but it's, it's relatively early work. Um, so we've worked on summarization for many different genres, summarization over news, over journal articles, 
um, conversation in the medical domain, um, and my favorite, uh, summarization over creative texts like novels or novel chapters. Um, so here's an example. This is from one of the data sets that we work with. Um, it's a very short input dialogue, and the summary here is o Orion's rat died and he misses him. You may ask why we need to have summaries of sh such short dialogues, but it does let me put uh, an example on the, te on the slide so you can see it. Um, this is what we would call an abstractive summary because it, it, it draws content from various parts within the input dialogue, but it rewords it to produce a more uh, coherent output. We could have an extractive summary, and uh, for years this is what people primarily worked on. Um, here we would take exactly the strings of text that we had in the input. Um, we're conveying the same content, but it's not exactly fluent. I miss him, my rat, he died. Um, so when most of the, with the shift to language models, uh, most of the work on summarization shifted to generating abstractive summaries. And when we have more abstractive summaries, we have the introduction of hallucinations. Uh, for summarization, we call this the faithfulness problem because the generated summary is not faithful to the information in the input. Uh, so here we have an input. This is a sports um, article. I always have to think about what sports. I think this is wrestling. Um, Klitschko doesn't have the legs, the power that he used to, said Lewis. He has a chink in his armor. Um, and here is a summary produced by Bart Large. Um, and this has a hallucination. It, it has mixed up, instead of um, attributing chink in his armor to Klitschko, it's attributed to Anthony Joshua, who also is mentioned in the input article. So this is what's called an intrinsic error. Um, the summary int doesn't introduce any new information other than what is in the input, but it sort of mixes up uh, how things go together. If the summary instead was President Joe Biden has a chink in his armor, uh, this would be what is called an extrinsic error. Uh, Joe Biden was not mentioned in the input, but he, he is drawn in and included in the output. Um, so now let me start first with um, characterization, what types of errors occur and why. Uh, so data sets are problematic. They are one of uh, the biggest causes for hallucination. Um, there have been various data sets that have been heavily used within the NLP community. One of them is Exum. And in fact, if you look at the most uh, recent, um, the large language model papers that came out and reported their results on summarization, they typically used XSUM. Um, XSUM of all the data sets is the worst offender. 77% of the ground truth summaries in XSUM are in faith, unfaithful to the input. And that's because this um, data set was created heuristically by taking the first sentence in each article, and we all know that news has a lead, and typically the first part of the article will give the most important information. Uh, so they created it by removing the first sentence, counting that as the abstract, and then the rest of the article as the input. And sometimes that first sentence conveys information that's not in the rest of the article. Other data sets that are very commonly used, CNN, Daily Mail, and Newsroom, have a smaller amount of hallucinations. But models that are trained on XSUM have a similar level of hallucination as uh, the data set itself. Um, 
Furthermore, work has shown that the majority of the model hallucinations are extrinsic, um, and 90% of those that are generated are not factual. So the Joe Biden uh, example would fall into that case. Uh, named entities are particularly problematic. Um, so in work that we've done, um, just by filtering X sum, we can improve the, to remove uh, problematic uh, summaries. Um, precision improves by almost 5%. And if we do joint modeling of summarization and generating entities that are worthy to be included in the summary, um, we can get an additional 1%. So we see that cleaning data sets is important, and it helps. Another kind of interesting error that we have looked at um, is uh, what we call nationality bias in summaries. Um, so here is an example of how that might occur, uh, where the input article tells us that Zhang Li is a well-known French writer, um, but the summary um, sticks to the ethnicity associated with the name and instead falsely tells us that Jung Lee is one of South Korea's uh, best known writers. Um, so this is something uh, that we looked at in more detail. Um, summarization um, up to the point of the most recent large language models uh, generally followed a, an approach where you start off with a foundation model and then you adapt it through fine-tuning uh, on data for the summarization task. Um, and prior work has shown, uh, using intrinsic evaluation, that the foundation models contain both linguistic and societal biases. Uh, and we also know from prior work that um, summarization systems tend to produce hallucination. So the question that we had was for these kinds of biases that we see, do they come from the foundation model or are they coming from the summarization model? Uh, so we did experiments where we perturbed the nationality in the input article and then we asked the question of whether the model could generate the input nationality without hallucinating. And we did this ov over a wide variety of names from a wide variety of countries. Uh, so we can see an example here where in the original article we have Antoine Richard who's from France and we substitute in um, Naoke Sukahara. And we can see that uh, it it cannot generate, in this case, um, the input nationality. It tells us he was born in Tokyo. But furthermore, to um, somehow make the summary realistic, <laughs> given the change, it also tells us that he was born to a Japanese father and a French mother. Again, totally hallucinated. Um, so with this kind of data set, we looked at I don't know, maybe 10 different countries. And we looked at when we perturb the, national, the uh, nationality, uh, the name, so the original person was from Japan, but the input article was from Cuba, for example. Uh, we see in red, there's a much higher rate of hallucination. And you can see that that happens uh, for the different um, Asian nationalities, and we have a 33% a hallucination rate for Korean and Vietnamese in particular. Um, but if we look at um, names which are associated with countries in the Americas, we have a much lower hallucination rate. So we found, in general, a disproportionately high rate of hallucination for Asian entities. And uh, we did tests with in intrinsic bias in the foundation model. And we see a strong association between the pre-trained language model's intrinsic bias and the observed hallucinations. The more abstractive the model, um, the more these 
biases will propagate more directly into the summary, while with a more extractive model, the less that happens. And the choice of data on which we fine tune affects the bias, how bad the um, hallucination rate is. Yeah. Corresponding to real people that are um, yeah um, so that's a good question because when we first did it we were concerned that perhaps we were taking uh, celebrities or or political features uh, so we focused just on people who had won uh, sports events or people who had played and were reported on in sports events. But yes, we took them from Wikipedia articles and we substituted, so. And it's a hallucination if the model. If the input summary. Summaries incorrectly, but maybe more consistent with the reality. Um, for that person. If that person, yes, has been memorized. I mean, we considered things like, for example, uh, morphology. Because you know this was this was happening with Asian names and not with other names, so it did not seem to be just a memorization question, because it did not happen in other cases. Um, so we considered whether morphology, you know, morphological features would might have caused the problem. Uh, we did not uh, find evidence for that. Sorry, could you define what that means? I don't. Oh. Yes, I apologize. Yeah, sorry. I. <laughs> that's okay. I've heard a lot of words here that I don't know what they mean either, and I'm trying to figure out. Like we're talking about the same thing, but our words are entirely different. Um, yeah, I, I just mean that uh, the form of names are quite different, distinctive, like the different. Um, syllables that are used and combination of letters are quite different from what you see in the Americas, Europe, um, all together may have, you know, they may have a more similar kind of grouping of, of syllables and sounds. Yeah, so I did not report on how we did the intrinsic bias test here, but we did it by um, given a name, seeing whether the uh, language model was able to predict the nationality. And it was for the Asian ones. Um, so what have we learned overall? Well, noise in the data set results in a summarization model that hallucinates. Um, the biases of pre-trained language models appear as hallucinations in the downstream summarization task. Uh, we've also done work on the same problem in the medical domain, and we find that it occurs there. Um, one of the things I do point out here is that when we see uh, uh, reports of performance of large language models on these data sets, we cannot trust the results. Um, and, you know, I would call out names here, <laughs> but we have some authors or, or so people associated with the authors in the audience, so I won't. Um, but you know, basically, you should look very carefully. Um, so let me turn to mitigation. What kind of methods can we use to correct errors? We've already seen that cleaning the data set um, can help. Uh, we've done work both with contrastive learning and meta-learning. Um, so con contrastive learning has been used in multiple different ways and has been shown to improve faithfulness. Um, one of the key ob observations is first the standard automatic metrics. These are metrics which are called bleu and rouge. And what they do is they measure overlap word overlap between a gold standard reference and the generated summary. Um, but these metrics, which have been used for years and in fact are often used to report success on benchmarks within the, uh, the large language model papers, um, they are inadequate at measuring uh, factual consistency. Um, 
so instead, we proposed and developed a computationally efficient metric based on question answering. And the idea is that uh, for every question that we could ask about the summary, we ask the question whether the answer in the summary um, is equal to the answer generated from the document. Um, and if it is, then we have consist faithful consistency. We're reporting the same information. Um, because our metric is efficient, we can use it as, um, as part of our loss function in, and in contrastive learning. So we use the, the metric as a training objective to train the model to produce summaries that more often have the correct answers uh, uh, as in the document. And we find that this method um, retains improvement on scores like Rouge, which measure things like fluency, but it provides uh, similar increases on these factual metrics. Um, however, uh, if we look closely, um, we'll find that faithful summaries are often more ex extractive. Um, they copy more from the input, and needless to say, if you're copying from the input, you're going to most often be reporting um, information that was conveyed. Uh, so we can see this in this chart. On the y-axis, we have um, metric scores, which where one would be the top. We have three different kinds of metrics that are often used for measuring faithfulness, entailment, uh, FACCC, and DAE. This was a little before the question answering work. I think a lot of people now use question answering metrics. And you can see that for each of the metrics, um, faithfulness is inherently correlated with extractiveness. Um, and that sort of makes sense. The more you copy, the more faithful a summary you're going to have. Um, the problem is that when we're looking at faithfulness, it's unclear whether the improvements are due to improved extra abstraction, whether we actually made a better abstractive model, or whether it's just because they are copying more. So um, we propose we want to measure pro progress in designing uh, models with better abstraction to tease apart where the source of improvement comes from. And we mitigate it with a selector model that learns how to select uh, the model with the highest abstraction, um, but with faithfulness scores that um, are better than a learned threshold. So we started off looking at this by doing some experiments with oracles. Um, we generate uh, summaries from models trained on different quartiles of this graph that we showed before. Um, and we evaluate the faithfulness of each and select uh, the output that has the most abstractive out, uh, output. And we can see that the Oracle model does improve in faithfulness over the baseline. So uh, we have... Um, and, and coverage decreases, which means it copies less. It is more abstractive. Um, so we then develop a selector model where we fine tune our um, faithfulness, our model for faithfulness on data that we've collected for these different quartiles from uh, least abstractive to most uh, abstractive. Um, and we use that to score summaries that we generate um, for how faithful they are. So at in inference time, we generate uh, summaries from these different quartile models. We score the summaries for faithfulness, and we then pick the most abstractive and faithful summary. And we can see uh, with our results here, above the curve is better. Uh, we have managed to increase faithfulness at the same level of ec extractiveness. So here, what did we learn? We 
first, we need to move away from metrics like rouge and bleu, which have been used for summarization and machine translation, um, to uh, metrics which are now commonly used, question answering or entailment. Um, contrastive learning, I've, I've seen it in a number of different contexts, is an effective method for mitigation. Um, but um, evaluating progress through faithfulness scores alone is not sufficient. We need to look at this extractive abstractiveness trade off. Um, I talked about only a few mitigation strategies, but actually we have explored quite a few, and usually they're explored separately. It would be nice to see a comparison across the different strategies. Um, and so, as I said, in this part of the work, I've been talking with models like um, their, their what I thought were large language models until the most recent ones came out, but they were language modeling, BART, Pegasus, for example, among others. Uh, what happens when we look at the large language models uh, that are currently avail available? Do the latest of these hallucinate? Um, and so we have seen that they've surged in performance, and our question, uh, two questions, how do they perform on summarization tasks and where should we focus our efforts on fu future summarization research? Um, so this is work that uh, is joint with Stanford and um, it will appear in both TACL and EMNLP this fall. Um, so we did evaluation of 10 diverse lang large language models on the task of single document news summarization, which I have been talking about before. Um, and uh, some of the models that we looked at are shown here. Um, and what, what we can see is that instruction tuning, uh, which is here, is the key uh, to zero shot summarization. Uh, these are um, judgments made uh, by people. Here I'm showing them on coherence, but on factuality we would uh, see similar results. Um, the other thing that we see is that the reference summaries, and I'm showing them here only for XSUM, uh, but if we also found this for CNN, they are judged by humans to be worse than the output of um, these large large language models. Um, so what we did, um, seeing that the reference summaries in these data sets were poor, um, we had people rewrite the summary. So instead of using the heuristic for XSUM where the first sentence of the article is taken out, um, we had workers, crowdsource workers on XSUM write um, who are writers, so they're freelance writers, write summaries uh, for 100 samples um, out of XSUM. And what we can see here is that Instruct GPT-3 is judged similar in quality um, to the freelance writers. And if we look furthermore into the faithfulness problem, uh, we see on the XSUM data set with the rewritten summaries that the faithfulness scores are close to perfect in the zero sh shot setting for Instruct GPT. Um, we see that the scores drop by 20 to 30 points when we include even five examples as input in the context, so for a five shot model, so even including a very small amount of data, um, noisy data is problematic. So what does this tell us? Well, <coughs> it tells us that the single document news summarization problem is solved. And we can ask, is this surprising? In many ways, no. For years, uh, you know, we, we've known in prior work, so work uh, that we did, that 
very small differences in the metrics on the scores yield very small differences in the summary output. And so it's questionable as you get that small change on, on the leaderboard, does it actually correspond to a difference that humans would uh, appreciate? And we think not. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, yes, it is surprising because as soon as we went to these abstractive models using any form of language modeling, faith faithfulness was a problem. Uh, so does this mean summarization is solved and we should all stop working on it? I would be unhappy. <laughs> uh, and what uh, we think and we are looking at is that different genres can be difficult. So we've looked at novels and narratives. We first uh, did it about four years ago um, and we're now looking at, at it again. It requires being able to interpret what was the point in the input, uh, which you do not have to do with news. You have very long input. Dialogues can also be challenging and we've looked at TV episode summaries and meeting summarization, and we have some of the same issues there. Um, I think long documents with non-standard genres, for example, legal, in the legal field, it's a very different kind of summary that you want. And if you're looking at a multi-document setting, which is a more interesting setting in the context of news, you may like to track what everybody is saying on a particular event and how it changes over time. Uh, that is a problematic setting. Uh, we have started work on characterizing um, how large language models do on novels and narratives. We have looked, are looking at things, whether the model simply memorizes the data. We see evidence of that already. If we take an input chapter where the characters are only named by pronouns, the summary will produce the proper name so it knows. Um, our questions, does the model learn the point of the narrative? In our initial work, no. This is where it has the most problems. And is faithfulness uh, more of an issue than in news? And uh, our work so far shows yes. We had um, judging the faithfulness of summaries some um, experts. So these were people working in summarization, Mechanical Turk workers and workers from Upwork who are better than Mechanical Turk. And we generated summaries of short stories collected from Reddit. Um, we can see that our expert annotators give all models low, very low faithfulness scores, so it is still an issue there. Um, but we also see that it's much harder to evaluate summaries in these settings because the input is so long. So we're also looking at how we can do that. So, Overall, uh, what have we learned? Um, noisy data results in noisy models. Summarization cannot be measured using uh, reference-based metrics on noisy data sets. And we can develop me mitigation methods to improve faithfulness. And now I'm going to shift gears um, and talk a little bit about our work on understanding African American language. Um, we heard earlier this morning from Eve that prior work has identified that there are biases in task-specific models, so models that judge how toxic <coughs> generated output is disproportionately label um, African American language as toxic. Um, so our question is, do large language models like ChatGPT uh, hold biases against uh, African American language? And we examine bias as a gap in performance between AAL and white mainstreamed English. Um, and uh, we see here that a preference encoded in a large language model uh, for a particular language variety can indicate representational harms. So uh, why do this work? Well, we want to enable equitable and fair applications. Uh, we've seen prior to LLMs that PASC algorithms used in psychiatry and medicine have been shown uh, to be racially biased. Um, and there, there are questions, of course, on the other side. If they do understand uh, African-American language well, 
It does enable more increased p police surveillance of minority groups. Um, and we've also seen one of our co-authors who is a linguist who specializes in, uh, whose expertise is in African American language, tells us that African American speakers talking about race related issues lose, use language to very subtly foreground the race issue. Um, so a lack of understanding of AAL will limit the use of large language models by AAL speakers and this particularly unfairly impacts such speakers in applications such as health and mental health. Um, so by African American language, we mean um, uh, this, the grammatically patterned variety of English used by many, but not all, and not exclusively African Americans in the United States. And we see some examples here. And one of the things that we see is there's a pretty wide variety in terms of how it's used in different texts, from Twitter, where it tends to be used more performatively, so we may get more extreme cases, uh, to a case like this, where we have quite a few features in the first sentence, to a case like the last one, where we have few, and it's called um, camouflaged because they use a phrase like talking about, which means one thing in English and another thing in African American language. And we contrast this with white mainstream English, which is the dialect of English that reflects the linguistic norms of white Americans, and that has been the encouraged standard of form of English taught in American classrooms. Um, first, we created a data set with AAL variation. So um, we have uh, six different sources um, with variation in the amount of AAL they use. So a number of them from Twitter. Uh, the Coral is an interesting group of uh, natural conversations occurring between um, investigators and children who speak AAL. Um, we had some focus groups in our research lab, which was with the black community. And so we used some of that. And we also took um, hip hop lyrics. And uh, to measure this, how well the models did, uh, we had four native African American language speakers generate counterparts for each AAL text. Um, and so we might start with an original AAL like this above, and we had them generate a white mainstream English counterpart, which um, captured the meaning that occurred originally. Uh, we then evaluated six different models of different size and architecture, BART, uh, T5, Plan D5, GPT-3, ChatGPT, and GPT-4. Um, <coughs> and we measured it in two ways, by looking at how well it did on the counterpart generation task. And for models where we could, um, we used a mass span prediction task where we looked at the probability of generating the correct word at a mask spot in the input. Um, we used uh, automatic metrics, so Rouge, looking at word overlap, um, BERT score, which is based on cosine similarity between the embeddings of two strings of text, so it should capture semantic similarity, um, and also human judgments. And uh, what we see is that large language models struggle uh, to both interpret and understand AAL, here are uh, bar charts showing how well they perform on the task of generating AAL from WME on the left or from generating WME on the right from AAL. And we compare against our gold standard reference in our data set. Um, and we see that all models perform better when generating WME than when generating AAL, except when they're trained directly on the data set. So Plan T5 allows training, that's uh, this one in blue, and it does better. 
Um, and these differences between GPT-3 and chat GPT are signif uh, significant. Um, our hu human judgments reveal further biases. So we asked annotators to judge them using a Likert scale. And they looked at human likeness, how uh, close the, the generated counterpart is to uh, how much it sounds like a person. Um, whether it is in the dialect of either AAL or WME, and whether it preserves uh, meaning or tone of the counterpart. Um, and again, we see uh, models struggle to produce human-like AAL, so that's on the left side. They're um, not good at producing language that sounds like AAML. And when they're producing WME from AAL, they struggle with the meaning. So they're unable to understand the meaning of the input AAL. Um, we can see some examples. I'm sorry, I'm going to go through this quickly because I'm at the end. Um, but here, like if we look at the first one, um, we have the source AAL from our data set. Um, then we have the equivalent WME as produced by our annotator, so that would be the gold standard. Um, and then we have the outputs produced here we show from two different models. Um, and they do have uh, lexical misinterpretation, so faded means high and they fa often fail to get that. Uh, shorty, which is in I guess it's not in one of these, but it's in one of the others. Um, they they um, interpret as young, where it should be girlfriend. There are syntactic uh, differences. Um, and they also fail to understand that sometimes this word can be used in a uh, normal, you know, as a regular uh, setting. And here it is used um, to be self-referential. Um, it means me. So what have we learned here? Um, we heard, we've learned that LLMs better match the wording of gold standard references when generating white mainstream English than when generating African American language, that white mainstream English is more likely to be judged as human-like and to match the dialect that was intended, uh, but they have difficulty um, in generating WME that matches the meaning and the tone of the gold standard, indicating that they have difficulty interpreting L AAL. Um, so here, in order to develop LLMs that can appropriately interact with and understand African-American language speakers, uh, we need more work uh, with these models. <laughs> So the questions that all of my students in my class ask, <laughs> is there more research to be done in natural language processing? And my answer is always yes. And I have several things here. Um, summarization of more diff difficult genres is still uh, needs work. Um, adaptation to less represented dialects. Um, we're doing work on uh, identifying implicit information in language and looking in particular at generics, all birds fly, uh, but penguins don't. Um, and they don't perform well on that. Um, and also we need to do new work adapting to new methods where we actually use the large language models and other representations. So for example, one problem that we're working on a lot is interpretability and generating explanations. And we can use the LLM uh, to do part of that task. Um, oh, so I want to thank um, my collaborators and the work I reported on here. Some of it has been done in collaboration with Cornell, NYU, Stanford, um, Amazon, uh, University of North Carolina and my two collaborators on the AAL task, uh, Desmond Patton at University of Pennsylvania and Jesse Greaser at University of Michigan. And as always, this work wouldn't happen without my students. 
and I'll mention my funders. So thank you. Yes. Um, so I think in general, when there are fewer AAL features, the model does better. Um, and it will also depend on the vocabulary, but we did, we did see problems across all genres. Yeah? Um, clarification question on the AAL features. Um, so in the AAL results when evaluated by humans, I noticed that the plan T5 model is better on, than humans on metrics like human likeness and other things. I was wondering if that was a function of the data set it was fine to know, like maybe it was just really good data. Yeah, um, yeah, we're not actually, so let's see. Um, so human-like, this one down here. Yeah, uh, we're not sure why that happened. Yeah. Oh, I have a question about the cross benchmark for the summarization. So you said it was automated, and uh, so how does the question answering work in an automated way? Is it done through a model? Or? Oh, the quals, yeah, the metric was automated. So yes, it is a model, um, it, it generates questions, so it's a question generation model, and there's also an answer generation model, and actually it jointly generates the questions and answers at the same time. So, yes, there could be some error in the fact that that is automated, but it's still better than not using it at all. There, there are um, a variety of different metrics now that use question answering. Yeah. Yeah, I have a follow-up follow -up question on this question answering metric. I just wonder, are there any criteria of picking those questions? I guess they cannot be randomly generated, like, you know, we do generate all questions generate that, all that questions. the model can generate for the summary and, can, and, and do the answer. Maybe more strategically or you know, efficiently is checking what I want, there's got the laundry list, uh, it can be time consuming, I, I, I guess. Um, so, so it can be, like a number of the metrics that have been developed, they're not used as um, an objective in training the model because they are too computationally expensive. Right. So some of the earlier metrics, um, like there's one that came out of uh, Kai and Cho's lab. There's another um, that is uh, Alex Fabry, who has done a huge amount of work in summarization. But in this one, we focused on doing it so that it was computationally efficient. And I should give all the credit to that, uh, for that to Feng Man, who was at Amazon at the time. I'm wondering how do you see what is the difference between when you do this and white mainstream to African American language? What is different from looking at it as translation? Are there like <coughs> further biases that maybe are not explained when you say, for example, when you, when you mentioned that uh, one of the models uses the, the, it, the it is it that. is like a translation task. It is, but translation. So here, I, um, we've measured close, in the high 90s of the words are the same, percent of the words are the same between the two different um, texts. Whereas in translation, uh, the vast majority of the tokens would be different. But it's like a translation task. We call it counterpart generation because, um, yeah, you, in, in doing it, there is some interpretation of what is intended at, at, in the input. Yes? Um, so related to all of the paleo cases of LLM that you talked about, and maybe it's most relevant in like the EAL studies, do you think it's the case that adaptation of these treatment elements that do seem to have these biases is a good strategy to try to overcome this? Or do you think there's something like the root cause is the pre of the LLMs that you know, we saw what Ross talked about? Like, 
is it something that needs to be addressed at that level, or do you think there's still work that can be done, given that the pre-training is kind of biased to be kind of adaptive models? Yeah. So we are looking at, having done that work, we're now looking at doing work where we do adapt so that we can, and our focus is less on generating AAL. I'm not, we're not sure that that actually is appropriate, but on interpreting AAL as input and we're making use of um, uh, uh, fine tuning with a model uh, trained on phonological units and using phonological rules. So um, I'm curious about the like the implications of like mo model size and also like data availability for like kind of multilingual or like kind of cross-lingual uh, settings. Like like do you, if you really need to have such a big language model to have abstractive summarization, does that mean we're stuck only doing this for English? Like how do you think about that? Um. So we have done work on cross-lingual summarization, but we're limited in domain sort of on where, you know, where we can do it. And um, we found that you, you could do it using direct cross-transfer between models, so you don't have to have the full data set, you, but you do need some data in the different languages in order to test. Um, it's not a heavily worked on topic, I would say, cross-lingual summarization or multilingual summarization. Um, so that does imply that somehow we're missing out there because most of the large language models are trained for English. Um, I, there is a lot of work sort of at looking at how well models can do in low resource settings. So I, I have a number of grants where we're working on that. Um, so, you know, wanting to transfer one, from one language, language to another without having all of the data for both. Um, and what would I say about that? We haven't been looking at it for summarization as much. Um, in general, having uh, different methods that accompany the large language model uh, do better than just the large language model alone. So for example, in one work that we're looking at with measuring um, whether c communication is successful, if we incorporate social, sociolinguistic theory into the input, uh, we do better. And that's a result that I like to see. <laughs> okay, thanks. So,